What's up, short attention span history nerds? I'm Mike Perry, and you're watching 10 Minute History. Have you ever heard of the Anglo Zanzibar War? Not many have. You've watched YouTube videos that lasted longer than this war. You see, in 1896, Zanzibar went to war with Great Britain, and the entire war lasted a whopping 38 minutes, give or take a couple minutes. It all began with the signing of the Heligoland Zanzibar Treaty between Great Britain and Germany in 1890. Germany would have control over Tanzania, while Great Britain would have control over Zanzibar. Britain declared Zanzibar a protectorate of the British Empire, meaning that they would back up the Zanzibari military if ever the need arise. Britain quickly moved to install their own sultan to look after the region. Hamad bin Thawani, who was a supporter of the British in the area, was given the position in 1893. The new sultan ruled over the relatively peaceful protectorate for just over three years until on August 25th, 1896, he died suddenly in his palace. It's believed that his cousin, Khalid bin Bargashi, poisoned him in order to gain control and overthrow the British rule. Now, the reason for this theory is that the Wani was healthy and had no signs of being near death, coupled with the fact that within a few hours of his death, Khalid had moved into the palace and assumed the position of Sultan without British approval. The British diplomats to Zanzibar were pissed, and the chief diplomat in the area, Basil Cave, and that's a solid British name, quickly declared that Khalid should stand down. Khalid, however, ignored the diplomat and started building up his forces around the palace. By this time, the forces were well armed by British weapons. 3,000 well-armed men surrounded the Sultan's palace, prepared to fight and die for their Sultan. They even had two small boats and a royal yacht fitted with guns and cannons positioned in an attack formation for a sea battle. Three boats against the entire Royal British Navy. Not surprising the Brits sank all three of them within seconds of the first shot. You gotta give it to them though, they had some brass cojones. The British already had two warships anchored in the harbor, originally placed there to defend Zanzibar, but that quickly went sideways. The troops that were stationed there to defend Zanzibar were quickly being sent ashore to set up offensive positions, protect the British consulate, and to keep the local population from rioting. Cave also requested backup from another nearby British ship, which entered the harbor the previous night. Now, even though the British consulate had a significant armed presence in the harbor, they knew they didn't have the authority to fight without the expressed approval of the British government. In preparation for an attack on the British troops, Cave sent a telegram to the foreign officer that evening stating, are we authorized in the event of all attempts at a peaceful solution proving useless to fire upon the palace from the men of war? The next day, two more British warships entered the harbor, one of them carrying Rear Admiral Harry Rawson, commander of the British fleet. He gave Cave a telegram from Whitehall stating, you are authorized to adopt whatever measures you may consider necessary and will be supported in your actions by Her Majesty's royal government. Do not, however, attempt to take any actions which you are not certain of being able to accomplish successfully. In other words, don't this up. The final ultimatum to Khalid was issued on the 26th of August, demanding that he leave the palace by 9 a.m. the next day. That night, Cave also demanded that all non-military boats leave the harbor in preparation for war. At 8 a.m. the next morning, only one hour before the ultimatum was to expire, Khalid sent a bold reply to Cave stating, we have no intentions of hauling down our flag and we do not believe you will open fire on us. Apparently, Mr. Khalid never heard of a little war that the Brits had just a little over 100 years earlier with this thing called the 13 Colonies. Cave replied in British diplomatic style, stating that he had no desire to fire upon the palace, but unless you do as you're told, we shall certainly do so. That was the last Cave heard from Khalid, and at 9 a.m. the order was given for the British ships in the harbor to begin bombarding the palace. And bombard they did. Volleys of explosive shells were launched from the British ships with extreme precision. British forces on the ground opened fire on the palace and a few loyalists on the ground as well. 
By 902, the majority of Khalid's artillery had been destroyed and the palace's wooden structure had started to collapse, with 3,000 defenders inside. British soldiers took aim at the Sultan's flag on top of the palace and quickly shot it down. One, possibly two, rifle shots were all that was reported that had come from the palace. It's also right around this time, two minutes after the bombardment started, that Reuters reported that Khalid cowardly escaped through a back exit of the palace, leaving his servants and his fighters to defend alone. Outside of the palace, pro-Khalid combatants fired small arms at advancing troops. Seeing that they were outnumbered and outgunned, they surrendered in less than a minute of fighting. By 9.40 in the morning, the shelling had ceased, and the shortest war in history had officially ended after only 38 minutes. For such a short war, the casualty rate was surprisingly high with over 500 of Khalid's fighters wounded or killed, mainly due to the high explosive shells exploding on the palace's flimsy structure. It's unknown how many of the casualties were combatants, but Khalid's gun crew was said to have been decimated. One British petty officer was also severely injured aboard one of the ships, but later recovered in the hospital. As for the injury to the British soldier, I couldn't find anything. Apparently it was insignificant and really not worthy of reporting. So the score was 500 to zero. All casualties were Zanzibari. Although the majority of the Zanzibari townspeople sided with the British, the town's Indian quarters suffered from opportunistic looting and around 20 Indians lost their lives in the chaos. To restore order, 150 British Sikh troops were transferred to Mombasa to patrol the streets and keep the peace. Now with Khalid out of the way, the UK was free to once again place their pro-British Sultan, Hamoud, on the throne of Zanzibar, and he ruled on behalf of Her Majesty's government for the next six years. As for Khalid, he managed to escape with a small group of loyalists to the local German consulate. Despite the repeated calls from the British for his extradition, he was smuggled out of the country on October 2nd by the German Navy and taken to modern-day Tanzania. It was not until British forces invaded East Africa in 1916 during World War I that Khalid was finally captured and subsequently taken to St. Helena for exile. After serving time, he was later allowed to return to East Africa, where he died in 1927. So there you have it, the shortest war in modern history. You know, had I included the names of the British ships and a few more non-essential personnel that I wrote down while I was researching this video, that this video would have taken longer than the actual war itself. If you enjoy short history lessons with sarcasm and humor, consider subscribing to 10 Minute History. If you like this video, consider giving it a thumbs up. And please check out my other videos. Until next time.